uh, the the objective of the directive is to uh, restore and maintain bird population uh, to a secure status and uh, it provides the directive provides uh, several tools uh, for reaching uh, this objective uh, the main one is the uh, site uh, identification and protection, whereby special protection areas uh, are selected and uh, uh, protected by member states and uh, managed according to uh, the ecological requirements of the species. And uh, uh, besides these uh, uh, special protection areas, uh, the directives also provides for uh, duties to manage, uh, let's say, the wider landscape uh, um, according to uh, the species ecological requirements uh, and to protect these habitats and even restore these habitats where necessary to indeed achieve the objective of the directive. Uh, the directive also provides for uh, requirements to protect the single species uh, individual from the from uh, bird population and uh, obviously it allows it provides a framework for uh, authorizing hunting provided that is sustainable and uh, the details um, the detailed uh, rules for allowing hunting are obviously uh, specified in in article 7 of the of the birds directive um, as I, as I said, uh, the SPA, so the special protection areas, together with the sites that are uh, designated under the Habitats Directive, are uh, constitute the Natura 2000 uh, uh, network of protected areas, which is uh, the largest uh, uh, network of protected areas, uh, uh, coordinated protected areas in the world, and is made up of more than 27,000 sites across the EU. And uh, these sites, uh, they cover uh, almost, uh, um, well, 18% of EU land and about 9% of the EU seas. And clearly the, uh, uh, the, the functionality of this network in terms of uh, uh, its management and its effective protection protection is key in delivering the objectives of, of the directive. Um, as you know, uh, in May 2020, the, the Commission also adopted uh, the uh, EU Biodiversity Strategy for 2030, and uh, uh, it has uh, the ambition to ensure that by 2050, uh, the world ecosystems are restored, resilient, and protected. And this goes hand in hand with, uh, with the objective that uh, of um, reaching climate neutrality by 2050. But as a milestone, the strategy also provides for um, a 2030 uh, target to ensure that uh, in Europe, biodiversity is on the path to recovery by, by that date. And to achieve this objective, uh, the, the strategy provides for uh, several actions, and I'm here only uh, mentioning uh, a few of them, uh, which are related to the protected areas target, uh, um, whereby the, under the strategy there is a commitment to legally protect 30% of EU land and 30% of EU uh, sea, and to ensure strict protection of one third of these areas, and to effectively manage uh, the protected areas and also to put in place a, a restoration plan um, to restore ecosystem, ac ecosystems across land and sea. And here, uh, th there is clearly a, a key role of the Birds and the Habitats Directive in achieving this, these, uh, these targets and, this, and these actions. Um, the Natura 2000 network provides the backbone of, uh, of the uh, trans-European network for nature that is, uh, um, that is uh, one of the targets of, of the strategy. So it provides uh, um, the, uh, the main, uh, uh, main share of, of this protected areas target. And uh, especially because the protection is in place since years and uh, uh, work is ongoing to ensure effective uh, management of, of these sites. But clearly uh, the target is about uh, protecting 30% of the land. So more areas will need to be uh, designated for protection to achieve the, the targets. And again, now with the links with climate change, there is an increased importance of, of protected areas uh, in, uh, uh, to reach the, uh, the, the biodiversity strategy goal. Therefore, it would be essential to 
uh, make sure that the additional areas are identified with with this uh, with this in mind. But the directives also provide a, a, a big contribution in terms of the restoration targets because restoration is required uh, already in the sites. Uh, but as I said, also in the wider landscape when it comes to habitat of the birds. And there are obviously uh, links and synergies uh, between the uh, biodiversity policy goals and the climate change uh, policy goals. Uh, natural restoration and conservation delivers on both. Uh, restoring nature uh, and protecting nature uh, enhances uh, carbon sequestration and therefore delivers on climate mitig change mitigation, but also uh, restoring nature and protecting it makes uh, nature more resilient to climate change, therefore delivering on the adaptation goals. So there are these opportunities for synergies between the two policies that we need to uh, uh, fully uh, address. And now uh, when it comes to uh, the current uh, uh, current knowledge on on uh, on the impacts of climate change. Well, according to the latest uh, reports that were submitted by by member states uh, under the Habitats and the Birds Directive, uh, uh, climate change is uh, is still a marginal pressure compared to other uh, other pressures uh, uh, for the for the species and the habitats that are protected. Uh, but it therefore it is important to really address, uh, keep addressing uh, the, the other pressures that act on, act on, the, on the sites. Um, on the other hand, the 2020 e, uh, report on the state of nature from the European Environment Agency highlights that uh, we, we, we see some impacts on species and ecosystems for climate change. And uh, the report qualifies climate change as an emerging threat and it goes farther by saying that if we don't adapt the management of these sites and the network itself, uh, the climate change will, will weaken the effectiveness of the protected areas network as we know it today. Therefore, uh, we, we really need to understand how the unavoidable climate change impacts will have to be factored in when it comes to identifying new areas for protection and managing these areas as well as the ones that are protected right now. So these are the key questions that I would uh, like to put on the table uh, and that uh, research uh, should, uh, let's say, help us addressing, uh, help uh, member states addressing when it comes to the identification of the additional areas that uh, will have to be protected to reach the 30% target. Uh, clearly, uh, there are uh, these unavoidable impacts of climate change that would cause or might cause uh, at least for some species, uh, shifted, uh, shifts in, in ranges. Uh, and therefore, it is important to, to assess how, uh, what are the areas that would uh, uh, be needed, uh, um, that is needed to protect in view of uh, protecting the most relevant areas for uh, these populations to be in, in good status, in secure status. But also when it comes to the management of the sites, uh, um, we need answers uh, to, uh, we need to understand whether climate change and the impacts that it will cause would uh, require an adaptation of the management of the sites. So do the conservation objectives and measures for the sites need to be adapted in light of the changes in temperature and other parameters that are linked to climate change? And if yes, how and where and when, and this is linked again to the effective management target uh, of the, um, under the biodiversity strategy. But also, as I said, uh, there is a lot of emphasis on restoration and the commission will come up with a restoration, uh, a proposal, uh, a legal proposal on, on restoration targets uh, in, uh, uh, in a short time. And uh, even more so in that context, uh, what are the, uh, the needs in terms of restoration in the light of the climate change possible scenarios? Uh, what areas uh, would need to be prioritized in terms of restoration to ensure that indeed the bird population as well as other species population would be uh, secured in the long term?
and more more questions uh, for for you actually uh, what are the species that are most uh, vulnerable to climate change so is there any prioritization that we need to do in that in that context to answer to the previous questions and uh, climate change is inevitably um, leading to uh, growing uh, uncertainties. So do we need to adapt site management and wider uh, landscape management uh, to those uncertainties? How do we do it? Are we, do we have the tools to, to, do, uh, to address these uncertainties? And also be beyond site management, uh, uh, as I said, uh, there is um, another component of the birth directive that is, uh, well, all the components, all the, or the whole implementation of the birth directive is actually linked to that. But if we think about uh, sustainable hunting, uh, how do we, uh, let's say, gather the data that are needed uh, to ensure that hunting is sustainable when it comes to bird migration and the changing migration patterns in light of climate change and any impact on climate change on the population sides, how do we adapt uh, uh, hunting, uh, uh, hunting bags to these uh, to this, uh, new realities? So all these questions need, we need to be addressed through uh, monitoring, more monitoring, research, modeling. So we do need uh, uh, science to, to support policy uh, development and implementation. And what are we doing already? Well, we, we have supported uh, and, uh, the, the Eurobird portal project, which is about indeed birds observation in the EU. Uh, we are uh, updating uh, now the, the, the guidance document on Natura 2000 and climate change. And this will uh, uh, should be ready by the end of the year. And uh, the aim is actually to, to promote win-win opportunities whereby the implementation of the nature legislation can be supported by, but can also contribute to the uh, climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation targets. And also we, uh, we, we are funding a life preparatory action for the production of uh, uh, high resolution bird population density maps based on, again, citizen science. And this will be once again, very useful in terms of the identification of the areas to, uh, to protect uh, in the EU. And uh, again, uh, linked to the implementation of the protected areas targets under the, under the, um, under the biodiversity strategy for, uh, for 2020. 30, we launched a call under the Horizon program that aims at generating evidence for the identification of the areas to be protected, as well as ecological corridors, which would um, uh, identify, let's say, the, the areas that are needed to allow species to migrate, uh, in, including in view of the impacts on, on climate, of climate change. Uh, so, I mean, my, my key messages would be that uh, obviously climate change and, uh, and biodiversity loss are interdependent challenges that, and problems that we need to address in an integrated manner. There are synergies, nature conservation delivers on, uh, on, on both. Uh, it helps uh, it, uh, mitigating climate change, but also uh, addresses adaptation uh, by making nature more resilient to climate change impacts. And considering the subject of, of, the, of the meeting today, uh, we, we really need your help, uh, the science, the help of the science of the researcher to address these questions. We need to, to make up a, an evidence-based policy. We need policy-related research to be, to be carried out. So thank you for your attention and uh, um, I'll be glad to answer any question you might have. Thanks. Thank you very much, Luisa. Um, we have a very short time for a question. So <clears throat> we have one here in the chat from Marta Plateau. And he asks, how do we pretend to protect any area at all against the effect of climate change? Would you have some ideas on this, Luisa? Well, I mean, uh, th this is... Uh... <laughs> 
in a way, uh, as I said, the, the idea uh, that was put uh, forward a long time ago by, by, the, by the birth directive is that when you protect the habitats of the species uh, and you manage these habitats according to what uh, the species ecological requirements are, you do uh, create, uh, let's say, the conditions for the populations to, to prosper in the long term. Now, as I have tried to, 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 to explain, obviously, this is, uh, um, this is an approach that has to be fully uh, considering, that will have to fully consider the changes of, uh, of, uh, that, that would be caused by climate change. So how the site management, how to protect the habitats of the birds in light of the new conditions, including temperature, but also extreme events, this will be crucial if we want the population to to, to survive and to prosper again in the long term, we will need to consider fully the changes in the condition in the sites and, and beyond. Thank you. Uh, just another very short question about the, you mentioned the life preparatory project. Is there any information available in, that can be found by the participants in an easy way? Yeah, I think I think on that, uh, that the information is not yet available, publicly available, but uh, once the, 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 let's say the contract and the action will be uh, finalized, this will be make, uh, uh, made publicly available. So if not yet, uh, this will become available. Excellent, great. Um, I would encourage you all who are listening to uh, ask some more questions in the chat, and I'm sure Luisa can try to answer them. Um, but I'm afraid we have to go on with the next speaker here, which is Sabo Snagi from Wetlands, in Wetlands International, who will talk more about distributional changes uh, uh, predicted for waterverse, especially in, on a, with a flyway perspective. Please, Sabo. Travels to your mood, muted. You have to unmute yourself. Travels, you are muted. Is it okay? Are you aware? That you... Yes. Sorry, I just had to change my screen, but now you. You don't really see the properly shared screen or no we we see the powerpoint view not the presentation yeah okay does it work now not yet now it's there thank you okay good thank you very much um so good afternoon everyone i'm savage now i work for wetlands international uh, european association as the biodiversity manager and I'm going to talk about two issues today. Um, one is the International Water Birth Census, which is um, a long-term monitoring program, which provides the basis um, for many of the presentations today, at least the data. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, the results of the Climate Resilient Flyway Project, in which we made some predictions, projections for uh, about the impact of climate change on uh, the range changes and um, suitability of sites for migratory water birds species. And this kind of gives you the, the, the medium long-term perspective. And some of my colleagues will talk about, um, yeah, what is happening already in relation to climate change and what are the implications of those. So to start with the International uh, Water Birth Census, this is a monitoring scheme which has started in um, 1967 with the aim of monitoring the status and changes in the distribution of water birth populations. And it's carried out um, at more than 15,000 sites in Europe and more than 140 countries worldwide. So it's, it's one of the, the largest, most extensive biodiversity monitoring schemes. It's a, a relatively simple uh, census, which is carried out in mid-January um, worldwide. So it provides information about wintering water birds. Um, and wintering distribution of water per populations. 
It provides input into uh, member states reporting under the EU Article 12 uh, reporting uh, under the birth directive, but it also provides input into the Iowa Conservation Status Report and setting the 1% thresholds under the Ramsar Convention, but by the virtue of Article 4.2 of the birth directive, it also has a relevance in the context of the SPA network designation. Uh, but beyond that, a uh, unique value of this program um, is that it also collecting this information at uh, a European or flyway scale, like the African Eurasian flyway, it provides the opportunity for higher level, larger geographic uh, scale analysis. So annually about uh, 10, 15 papers are written using the IWC data and the presentations today will also demonstrate this added value of the International Water World Census Scheme. So now I would like to speak a little bit about the Climate Resilient Flyway Network project and it, its results. So this is a, a project what Wetlands International and its partners have carried out uh, between 2015 and uh, 2022. Uh, the project aimed to support Iowa and its contracting parties in uh, climate change adaptation in the context, but it's also relevant in, in the context of the European Union, because that's situated in the Africa Eurasian flyway, but it gives a, a little bit broader perspective. And uh, the first component of this project focused on assessing the climate change exposure of water birth species and their key sites. Uh, so these key sites, we consider the ones which, which would qualify under uh, criteria two and six of the Ramsar Convention. Um, and we selected uh, 2050 as an analysis endpoint because that has a policy relevance both in the context of the uh, CBD and also in the context of the EU biodiversity strategy as a lot of the restoration targets are going up to 2050. So, um, yeah, it, what we can observe based on, on the models that in the temperate zone, the typical pattern is that um, different species are going to change, um, well, basically the shift of the range. Um, okay, sorry, the range of the species is going to shift a little bit, so um, more uh, to the north. So at the, there, there is a part of the range which, um, yeah, will remain unchanged, but there will be new areas. Well, there will be areas which will be abandoned at mostly at the southern edge of the range in, in the northern hemisphere. And there will be areas which will become climatically suitable for the species. And that's what we call the, the leading edge. Um, this is very different as we have observed in our research um, compared to Africa, where we can see more of a range fragmentation um, where, yeah, it's basically um, other factors are playing a more important role. What we also observed in our research is that um, the Afrotropical dispersive species are going to suffer on average the largest uh, decline. Uh, and the uh, Palaarctic migratory species are uh, most exposed in their breeding season. Of course, this is based on present substance data and it doesn't really show how the distribution, uh, where the core of the population is going to occur, but you will hear more about that um, in, the, in the coming presentation and also other uh, research shows that uh, the importance of individual site is also going to, to change. Within the, um, the group of the uh, Palearctic migrants, what we can see that uh, the largest declines, and then in some cases, this is going to go up to uh, 90%, is going to happen uh, amongst the high Arctic breeding species. There is nothing surprising there, but what is also interesting to see that uh, there is another group of the temperate zone species which are associated more with um, uh, arid zones, which are going to, to suffer major um, 
range losses. When we uh, aggregate the information at the level of the flyway, so we can look at um, panel A shows the, the current species richness, and you can see that there is a high uh, species richness in, in, in Europe, especially in the, in the temperate um, zone. Um, then panel B shows um, the number of species amongst the breeding ones, uh, which are projected to be, um, well, we call it emigrants. It's basically going to lose the suitability of the area. And panel C, the blue one, shows uh, the number of colonizer species. So you can see that more northerly areas are becoming suitable for more species as um, well, basically the winter, uh, the, the conditions are getting milder. And on panel B, you can see the, the balance, the net change in species richness. And uh, if we zoom into Europe, what you can see that, well, for most of Europe, there will be, um, yeah, no major change in the net number of uh, species richness, but um, the southern Mediterranean, well, the Mediterranean, especially the southern Mediterranean, but also Spain um, is going to suffer um, species losses. At the same time, the, the northern part of Europe is going to um, enjoy an increase in the number of breeding species. When we looked at sites, we can also see a very similar pattern in the changes in, in site suitability. And if we allocate sites to different climate change adaptation strategies, then, then we can see very clear geographic pattern. So um, the typical pattern what emerges shows that most of the Mediterranean sites belong to the increasing specialization category. This means that uh, these sites are going to lose species or the suitability of this uh, sites is going to decrease for um, the species which qualified them today. And these sites are not going to become uh, more suitable for, for other species, obviously because the Sahara separates um, them, uh, these areas from a lot of the Afrotropical species. And we consider it's very unlikely that they are going to be able to bridge that gap. At the same time, you can see that uh, in Northwest Europe, most of the sites are mainly uh, characterized by uh, high persistence. This means that, a lot, well, the sites will remain suitable for a lot of species, what is suitable for today. And you can see that in Eastern Europe and Northern Europe, um, sites are characterized by increasing value, which means that the site is going to retain some of the already existing uh, qualifying species, but it's going to become suitable for new species. And an example what I can give you easily is the Buix one. You might recall that the Buix one used to winter in the UK but with the ameliorating climate, it's first the majority of the population started wintering in, in uh, the Netherlands, then it shifted to Germany. And what we can predict that in the future, they might even not come as far as uh, Northwest Europe, but they might actually uh, remain in, um, well, the Eastern part of the Baltic. Um, so, this means that um, there will be major challenges for, uh, well, basically the Mediterranean countries to retain populations and maintain suitable conditions for those. Um, and at the same time, uh, for the Northern European, um, Eastern European countries, there will be challenges to, to basically accommodate uh, the new requirements of these, uh, what we call colonizer species, so species which are not going that far to wintering areas in the future, uh, or which basically can occupy new breeding areas. Um, but we can also see in the context of this that because, um, well, Palartic species are going to um, experience the ma major exposure in the, in the breeding season. And if we look at the, what proportion of these population are held in the critical sites, we can see that in the breeding season, it's a relatively small proportion. 
So for most of the species, um, we have relatively small proportion of the population in the critical sites. And only for a few species, we have higher proportions. And that basically means that uh, a site-based approach or size-based approach, which is focusing on internationally important sites, is not going to uh, help too much the adaptation of dispersed breeding um, water bird species in the future. And there are needs for other measures. So that basically means that, um, you know, uh, habitat conservation in the wider countryside uh, will be extremely important. So in this respect, the importance of the common agriculture policy cannot be overemphasized. And the importance of the, um, yeah, basically the nature, uh, nature restoration and the, the nature restoration plans what the countries are uh, going to draw up address the needs of these dispersed species. So not concentrating on a few sites, but also dispersed in the in the countryside. So just the conclusions um, to summarize, the polarctic water bird species are not projected to suffer major range contractions um, during um, any of the seasons, but um, in the breeding season, um, and the importance of key sites might change. Um, we can predict net loss in the Mediterranean and increasing importance of uh, Northern Europe and the Baltic. Species composition might be changing in between. And management measures uh, will be important both inside and outside of the protected areas. So this is how I would like to summarize my presentations. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tabots. Um, we have a few questions that come up during your talk. And one of them is about the sort of data distribution of the IWC. So why are there no observations in the United States and, and Canada, for example? All right. So um, yeah, the United States and Canada are not part of the uh, International Water Bird Census Network. This has kind of long traditional um, reasons. So one of the reason is that uh, traditionally the North Americans carry out the Christmas bird counts. So in a lot of the studies, what uh, Tatsuya, Manu uh, and others have carried out using the IWC data, actually the IWC data has been complemented with the Christmas bird count data for North America. The other reason is that, um, yeah, the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service is carrying out area surveys within the institution. So they have a, a fleet of uh, airplanes and uh, they have their own uh, monitoring program because it is an important part of their flyway management programs. So that's that's the historical and institutional reason. Okay, thanks. We have maybe time for one more question, which I actually there's two questions that I can sort of lump together because they're both dealing with the Arctic subarctic kind of issues that are going on, like where the biggest changes are project, projected to happen, right? Like major things like permafrost melting, and and what what can be done about this thing, and what do you what do your models think about the future for for water birds? Well, I think there are two aspects of this. One is uh, what our models um, project, so what will happen, um, and. Yeah, there is no surprising in our results. Uh, earlier studies also uh, projected that there will be major range contractions for high Arctic breeding species. Um, but I think what is more important is, is, is what kind of solutions can be found. And, and the models themselves don't really give the answers for that. Um, but and, and that goes back also to the earlier question. So, um, you know, the birds are not going to uh, respond necessarily to increasing temperature or 
uh, or increasing uh, precipitation. They are going to uh, respond to changes in the habitat and changes in uh, uh, interspecific interactions, which means food, it means also predation. So there is scope for um, what the literature call a compensatory or counteractive management measures. So um, that, that means that, for example, uh, in many cases, and this is not necessarily the most relevant in the, in the Arctic, but um, um, yeah, okay. So an example, a classic example of um, compensatory uh, measures might be um, that golden plover is sensitive to um, yeah, the, the increasing temperature. The increasing temperature acts through uh, the, the food supply. But if you are um, kind of closing a drainage ditches, then you can increase the wetness of the area. And by increasing the wetness of the area, you can compensate for the effects of the rising temperature. In case of migratory species in the high Arctic, where um, yeah, basically you cannot really act upon uh, their breeding grounds so much, um, you might actually compensate for some of the losses by making sure that during the wintering period, they suffer less losses. So they have a better starting position. And um, I think, Jon, you are much more qualified to talk about these than I am, but uh, we know from the Finnish studies that, uh, you know, protected areas are um, facilitating the northwards uh, migration and of species populations and their adaptation to, to the climate change. So uh, by managing the areas better and uh, extending the protected area network, restoring habitats which have been converted, let's say, into forestry at places where they shouldn't have been converted, you might actually compensate for, for some of the uh, pressures. What I would like to emphasize here is um, we tend to talk about climate change um, that it's going to happen in the long term. But one of the factor in this climate change adaptation strategies is that you need to boost the populations um, at close to the, uh, to the leading edge. And that basically takes time. So you actually have to start boosting those populations which are projected to suffer major losses now to create the colonizers which actually can colonize these new areas. And I think that's a very important message. With declining populations, we have less chances to adapt to the uh, consequences of climate change and, and a low bird populations to, to adapt. Because, well, largely the bird populations themselves will, will adapt their distribution. We just can facilitate that process. Excellent, thanks very much. Um, but I think now we have to continue. And the next speaker is uh, Ala Eldin Sultan from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, who will speak more about distributional changes in water birds, um, also using the European Breeding Bird Atlas. And so I think, Sabots, yes, yes, this is possible. Okay, yes, we can see your screen, Ala Please. Good. Just a second. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for your invitation and for giving me the opportunity to present my work about the future of breeding birds in Europe. I'm uh, Aladdin Sultan from uh, SLU University in Sweden. Uh, well, actually, the, the, we can see from the previous presentation and also from uh, publication before that the climate change over the last two decades among the most hot topic uh, and received the attention from uh, of the scientists from different fields, actually, is not only ecology, but also the economy, politics, uh, theology, and even medicine and medical science. 
but for college it's important for us for, to uh, uh, to protect the species. So we need to know more about how the species will respond or be responded to the ongoing or the projected climate change. So when we focus uh, on climate change, uh, it become apparent that, that uh, there is a lot of amount that, uh, of information that are available already. Uh, and we can get from this information uh, knowledge about how the species already uh, respond. Some of the literature recorded or uh, reported uh, change in species phenology, for example, uh, change in species uh, arrival timing for uh, of migratory species, uh, change in migratory distance, uh, also uh, something like increasing the uh, length of the breeding uh, season, uh, also change in species morphology, for example, uh, towny owls, uh, it's recorded that they have already changed their uh, morphology by increasing their melanin-based morphs. And other species like Basarain in North America, uh, they have reduced their body size and increased their uh, wing length in response to climate change. So the climate change, I mean, the ongoing climate change has also provoked species to, to do some changes in their uh, uh, traits and also in their uh, morphology. And also in terms of population, uh, there is also change in population uh, due to change in the post-biotic and abiotic condition. For example, in the rural uh, protected area network, uh, the core population, uh, I mean the mean uh, density of bird species there, they have shifted over the last 40 years uh, about 1.8 kilometer per year. So the shift or the change in the uh, population and, and uh, phenology is already going. But what also the most common uh, response for the species to the ongoing climate change is a change in uh, species distribution range. I think the first presentation also, uh, the second one, we talk about how, uh, that we need to consider how the species change their uh, ranges or distribution based on the climate change to consider this for uh, management. So, uh, Based on the, the study, there is a already recorded shift either northward or poleward and also upward for many species in response to the, the climate change. For example, Finnish bird, they have already shifted the uh, uh, distribution uh, about one kilometer per year. And also similar patterns have been observed for British birds, British breeding birds, uh, uh, and also in North America. So changes in both uh, uh, biogeographical uh, distribution and phenology is very common. But actually, uh, we need to consider the climate change, as Luisa said, for, for, for the uh, implementing an effective uh, conservation plan and uh, mitigation plan. Uh, so we need also to understand how the species will do in the future and how they will respond in the future. So this is why we need to uh, predict the response of the species to the uh, projected climate change. So therefore, in the uh, future bird scenario project, uh, we use the European breeding bird data uh, to predict future of uh, woodland birds in Europe using a species distribution model. Uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of uh, species distribution model, which has been extensively used uh, over the last two decades uh, for either uh, hind cast or forecast or even to, to the, to determine the uh, uh, potential distribution for many species. Uh, but in our study, we use species distribution modeling with two different sets of data. We used with uh, uh, European breeding bird atlas data, which is, uh, I would call it uh, EBA1 and EBA2. Uh, EBA1, or European breeding bird atlas data that were collected during the breeding season, uh, I mean, between uh, April and July, uh, from 1972 until 1995. So over uh, the European continent, uh, which is extended from the uh, eastern, uh, western border of Russia to the Atlantic Ocean. But actually in this study, we uh, we didn't use uh, the Russian part, the European Russia part and, and Turkey, uh, because the data in this site were not uh, reliable and uh, suffer from low sampling uh, coverage. And also the other set of data is a European breeding bird data, which is recently published, I think in uh, November, 2021. 
and it's also collected based actually it's based on national collected data from breeding bird uh, using the similar uh, uh, methods uh, for the EBA one. And it was between the data collected between 19, 2013 and 2017. So from these two sets of data, we can uh, estimate the actual change, or you can call it like observed change in uh, breeding range uh, uh, of the uh, uh, bird secure. So we can uh, measure the change in the distribution from EBA1 and EBA2 data. And uh, to link this with uh, what Louisa just said about the uncertainty, uh, so uh, EBA2 data, uh, provide us like a good opportunity to evaluate the prediction because some prediction they have like a source of uncertainty of course every prediction they have source of uncertainty uh, but uh, to like to minimize the uncertainty or to make sure about the, the prediction we need to verify it or to evaluate it according to uh, actual or uh, observed change so the EPA2 data provide us with this good opportunity so we can evaluate the prediction that we have uh, made uh, with this actual uh, change recorded from EBA1 and EBA2 uh, data. So uh, for this, I measured the change in uh, uh, range size. So how the much uh, uh, will be the change in the species range size. Actually, we used uh, only wetland uh, numbers of bird species. Uh, we used the data for uh, 64 uh, birds that their data are uh, suitable for prediction. Uh, so we found that almost like 75% of the species were predicted to contract their uh, ranges. Uh, so this uh, pattern was very common for the Norsoli uh, North species. I mean, this species breed in the northern part of Europe. While uh, all, uh, most of all species that were predicted to expand their distribution range or their breeding range, I'm talking about the breeding range, they were mostly southern breeding range. So they breed in the southern part of Europe. So uh, we found also some species with like south central distribution, like uh, little egret, uh, great white egret, red crested uh, butch uh, butcher, Kentish blubber as well. Uh, they uh, this species managed to like expand their breeding range in the future. So or they predicted to expand their uh, breeding range in the future. Other species like uh, common moorhen, little uh, grape, were predicted to maintain or no change will happen to their breeding uh, range in the future. Also, the second criteria we measure uh, uh, is the change in the uh, direction or the how the uh, species will change their uh, range direction in which direction. So in line with what uh, uh, in the uh, previous presentation, uh, they found that also we found mostly all the species, they shifted their breeding range northward toward the, the north, like between north and north uh, west. Very few species have changed their distribution uh, range or breeding range toward the south. Uh, and actually the, the main shift, I mean, the main displacement shift in the ranges centroid or the cool range, we, we predicted about uh, five kilometer per year. So the species might change their uh, distribution range five kilometer each year. Uh, and the third criteria, which is the uh, change in uh, range margin. So for this, both northern and southern range margin were predicted to shift uh, northward. Uh, but the magnitude of the margin uh, shift was dependent on the species. For, for also for Nusali species or the species breed in the north, their southern margin was predicted to shift northward. Uh, the, the displacement or the average displacement was about two kilometers per year. While for southern species, the shift uh, was almost uh, uh, six kilometers uh, toward the north, the mean, uh, six kilometers toward the north. Uh, when we talk about the uncertainty of the prediction, so we uh, managed to compare or to evaluate uh, our prediction based on the observed data from EBA2 data, and we found actually a significant pos positive association between the observed or the actual change and with the predicted change from our uh, species distribution modeling. Uh, 
this uh, this positive association or the uh, agreement between was between also change in range size and also in the direction not the direction the distance where the uh, species uh, will uh, displacement in the future or shift in the future. Uh, also, the predicted shift in the uh, range centroid will average greater than the observed one. So we, we predicted about five kilometer uh, per year, but actually the observed or the actual shift was uh, b uh, around uh, 3.9 kilometer per year. Uh, of course, some species showed some uh, opposite button and the species like uh, uh, common mergensers they showed opposite battle where we predicted they might uh, contract in the future, but their distribution, uh, uh, the actual distribution was opposite. So uh, what the take home message here, actually we can see from uh, uh, our work and also from the previous uh, work that the birds are highly vulnerable to the climate change. I mean, the ongoing climate change and also in the future. So we call for the urgent uh, intervention. Uh, so we need like to preserve and manage and restore the wetlands uh, across Europe. Uh, and this require uh, applying conservation measure, not only at the national scale, but also at the continental scale. Uh, as you can see from this graph here that uh, the current IUCN conservation status for many species, they are least concerned about based on the change in the distribution range, some of them, they might be endangered or even critical endangered while they are right now as a least concern. So this we uh, this might answer some point, at some point which is by Luisa presentation, what the species might do in the future and which species we might prioritize. Uh, so we need also to apply like a uh, special conservation planning. So prioritize uh, the, the, uh, the habitat and sites and also prioritize the species that they need immediate action. Uh, some mitigation and also like uh, controlling invasive species uh, the, and pollution, they might help also. Uh, probably also using uh, like implementing new uh, wetlands, creating, uh, creating uh, new wetlands like uh, small, uh, uh, several wetlands or uh, single large wetlands might help also to uh, mitigate the impact of climate change. And here I would like to thank you for attention and if there's any question I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Alele. Um, there's maybe some questions coming in the chat, but at the moment there's nothing, but I can, there's a bit of time. I can ask you, Alele. So you, you basically find that your models are, are sort of overestimating the changes when you compare them to the actual data. Uh, I guess in one way you can think of this as being good, right? Because it's conservative. Or do you think that more work is done to, to, to improve these models to try to, to, to get at a, a better prediction? How do you feel about this? Yeah, thanks. It's a really good question. Actually, when we do this uh, model, species distribution model, mostly they are a correlative model. Uh, they are not mechanistic. So we miss lots of variables like uh, uh, biotic variables. So, uh, so we are not predicting the realized uh, range. We predict the potential range. So it's good, uh, suitable for the species climatically and, uh, uh, and environmentally, but not, uh, I mean, the resources available there is not suitable for the species. So this is why most of this uh, model are overestimation, uh, overestimating the actual or the, the realized distribution for the species. So I'm not surprised to, to have like overestimated uh, model because lots of variables still missing. Thank you. There's a question here which deals with the sort of problem of drying out, which probably going to increase in future. So wetlands will become uh, difficult to, to keep wet. So is this something that that has you have tried to model this type of forecasted hydrological changes or do you have any more thoughts about this? Yeah, actually we consider the change in the land cover. So there is available data, but still, uh, yeah, we consider this in our model. But uh, the accuracy of this data will not like 100% to make sure it's accurate. Uh, so still throws some uncertainty in it. Uh, this is why we we should focus on the restoring the uh, uh, already exist protected area and to like create 
uh, a new wetlands for the, the, the species in order to mitigate the disease. Fabulous. You want some, to add something or ask something? Yes, thank you. Um, I just raised my hand because in our project, um, the hydrological team who produced our um, hydrological models specifically has accounted for uh, basically the, the business as usual scenario. So if we would extract water, if we would, uh, the economy would develop the same way as it does today. And also develop the kind of natural flow model. What would happen without this? And comparing these two hydrological models showed that there is a huge influence of uh, water management on how much water and wetlands are available. So the human extraction and how we manage water is much more important in this game than um, actually the impact of the climate change. Good. Um, we have just a, one more question, a very short answer, please, because we need to move on after that. But this question relates from to, to the difference between the predicted and the observed. Can it be so that for species where the prediction and the observed uh, do not match so well, is this perhaps due to, that land use changes are more important than climate change or, or other way around? How do you have you looked into this, Salah Elden? Yes, we looked for the impact of uh, or the, 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 the contribution of each variable, so land use and land cover, and also for the each of the uh, climatic variable. Uh, and for most of the species, I would say like 99% of the species, uh, precipitation and temperature were uh, among the most important variable for the species. And uh, land use were, were less important, but actually, the rule of the land use uh, variable is to to provide more accurate. So with that, that because this uh, land use data actually uh, developed based on the climatic model. So they are correlated, but at the end they provide us some information about where the wetland in the future might be. So it's give us like a clear idea or more accurate or to minimize the uncertainty to be more clear about this. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation and answering the questions. And now, but now we move on. So the next speaker is Diego Pafarnjordan from uh, the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research, and he will switch a bit uh, from from just talking about distributional changes to actually bringing in the role of protected areas. So please, Diego. Thank you, Jan. Yes, so hello everybody. My name is Diego and I work at, at Nina in, in Norway. And we are going to change a bit now to from future scenarios and future projections to, to look a bit to what has happened uh, or what the past uh, tells us uh, on how, how water birds have been doing in the past uh, three decades. <clears throat> so uh, many species have been, oh, we have noticed that many species in the past decades have increased the um, wintering populations in, in, in the northern part of their wintering distribution like in this uh, Dafted Duck, Golden Eye, Goose Anders, and Smew. And there have been important declines in the, in the numbers at the southern part of the distribution. And um, all those, uh, these long-term changes in abundance have been linked to long-term uh, changes in winter uh, climate. Uh, and what I have to say that um, we have been, all these analysis are, have been based on the, uh, based on, on data gathered uh, within the International Water Bear Census that uh, Savold has presented earlier in the second talk. 
and which give give these data give us a very nice uh, opportunity to explore this long-term and large scale changes in distributions and abundances of water birds in the winter. But not only those, not only long-term changes uh, in, win in winter, wintering uh, abundance have been have occurred, but also there are big year-to-year -year changes in, in, in local water bear abundance. For instance, we have here, in a warm winter, we may have so many sightings and individuals wintering around the Baltic Sea and fewer southern, south, uh, in the southern part of the distribution. Whereas in cold winters, we may have uh, fewer individuals in the north, and um, many more going farther south than the flyway. And, and um, this these year-to-year changes are very, is, is not only species specific, but it's more a, a general pattern for many species. So um, we have found that in those years with, with uh, colder winter weather conditions, uh, species tend to migrate farther, farther south uh, in winter. So they, they spend the winter uh, in, in lower latitudes. But, um, but this, uh, yeah. So in colder winters, they go farther south but also the the response to these uh, weather conditions also vary between uh, between species groups or or uh, depends on the ecology of the species. For instance, here we have the deep water species, like for instance the diving ducks that we have that they as they the the distribution shifts uh, to a northern latitude relative to previous years uh, when as, as the winter weather conditions uh, become mild and they go south also uh, as the winter weather conditions uh, become a bit uh, harsh and, the, and then we have a different type of response for species that use shallow waters that could be, for instance, Dublin ducks, where they are much more sensitive to cold winters. So they, they, they are pushed down the flyway south to, toward the southern latitudes um, much faster. And they, they do not respond as fast to warming uh, to warming temperatures or, or to more favorable weather conditions. So we have different type of responses between species. So fast response to, to warming and a, a bit slower response to warming conditions. And then we also looked at uh, long-term uh, changes. So previously it was year-to-year -year changes in weather conditions and, and distributions. And this is a uh, long-term changes. And it seems also that there are differences between different groups of, of water bear species. And we have that those using deep water, again, like diving ducks, their distribution have been, has been uh, moving towards the northeastern uh, Europe progressively from 1990s. And, and that pattern is not as evident in some other water bear species. So again, different uh, rate of responses to changes in weather conditions during the winter time.
And also, in addition, there are geographical uh, differences because we see that so climate change does not or, or water bears do not respond um, in the same way depending on where you are in within Europe and North Africa in this case. So for instance, we have all these wetlands situated in Southwest, the central part and in Northeastern Europe. And then we found that um, the local winter abundance uh, increases with increasing temperature much faster in North Northeastern Europe and that increase is not very evident in, in the southwestern part of Europe. So faster changes occurring in northeast, northeastern Europe uh, in terms of increasing winter abundance with temperature. So, so what, what does this imply or, or what, is, what are the consequences for conservation of, of, of these populations. So we may think that um, water birds, water bird populations, as they respond to changes in climate and move towards the Northeast, they may be moving outside the protected areas because they were protected areas were designated or a water bird population maybe 10 years or 20 years ago, and those populations are moving northwards and, and hence moving outside the, those protected areas. But we can also see, we can also imagine that those shifting individuals are using the network of protected areas as stepping stones as they move towards uh, more suitable conditions. And we indeed found that, for instance, in this SMEO case, which is an Annex 1 species, so it's a classifying species for SPA, we found that in, in wetlands situated in, in Northeastern Europe, at the northern range of this distribution, uh, the winter in numbers increased almost twice as fast inside SPAs than outside SPAs in the, in the past 20 years. And, all, and also, uh, again, if you see in this other study, we classified all the wetlands that are surveyed uh, within the International Water Bear Census in these four categories. Wetlands that are unprotected, so, and then wetlands that are listed as important bird and biodiversity areas by BirdLife International, which are not legally protected. They are uh, listed as EVAs, but they don't have any legal uh, protection. Then we have a third category, which are wetlands that are included in, in the network of protected areas. And then a fourth category, which is wetlands that are IBAs and also have some legal uh, status, uh, protected, is a protected area. And then what we found is that just maybe you, if you look at the green and blue, the top part. So this is the winter abundance and the years. We found that IBAs, the green ones, and protected areas that are also listed as a IBAs, they hold or they accommodate most of the most of the uh, wintering. Uh, populations and uh, 
and even especially in northeastern Europe, where where populations are expected to to increase or or to move to, we have a, a an important important uh, long term trend in in I in IVAs that that, that are also uh, protected. So. Yeah, so as summing up, we have this uh, general tendency of a uh, uh, shift in, in the abundance of water birds wintering in, in Europe towards Northern and Eastern Europe. And, and we have some evidence that uh, show that protected areas can accommodate those shifting individuals and, uh, and that trends inside protected areas uh, have been increasing uh, faster than outside protected areas, especially th those protected areas that were also previously identified as, as important bird and biodiversity areas by Woodlands Inter uh, by BirdLife International. But uh, we also showed that there are a large proportion of, of these, these populations or of, of many water bird species still winter outside protected areas, which, which uh, make them vulnerable to, to many uh, impacts uh, that, that uh, any, any type of anthropogenic uh, actions. And for instance, in the case of this mew that I showed earlier, uh, which is an annex one species, which means that uh, is is I mean is it has to be protected uh, under the birth directive. Uh, Ninety percent of the wintering population in Finland and Sweden still winter outside the network of protected areas, and this might be linked to to the fact that protected areas in northern Europe. Uh, were established several decades ago and under new climatic conditions uh, and, um, and less ice cover uh, during winter, new uh, potential good sites are arising and they are, being, they are being used by shifting individuals or, or, or by short stopping individuals in this case. So they stay wintering closer to the breeding grounds in the north, in the boreal region, and, and staying in these new available sites. So also based on, on our results, we can we see that non-protected IVAs or, or important bird and biodiversity areas still accommodate a, a large number of wintering water birds. These are not protected. So designation of, of these sites will uh, or can contribute to, to achieve the new EU protected area targets as Luisa was mentioning this 30% and also to helping climate change adaptation for water bird populations. And also I would like to emphasize that the fact that there is this general general tendency of moving north, it's important to keep a coherent and uh, comprehensive network of protected areas, because as we see this year to year variation in weather conditions, uh, during cold spells, for instance, or unusually cold winters that may still occur, many water birds are pushed down the flyway to southern Europe or southwestern Europe. And so it's important to also keep a, a suitable uh, areas for, for those in, in those cases. And this would be everything. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Diego. <clears throat> so we have time for a few maybe questions. So I can start with one that was asked from the public, which deals with the finding that you have that the numbers are especially increasing in site protected areas. So, but can this be due to, to also, for example, less disturbance in these protected areas that are, or other regulations? So, so in the in the case of, of the SMU, that uh, I don't know if you refer to that case, but anyway, uh, protected areas indeed, or they have different levels of protection, but one of 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 the main values is to uh, buffer against any kind of disturbance uh, and keep uh, keep a uh, high quality habitat as well through management um, which uh, Ellie will talk a bit more uh, after me and and which proves uh, very useful or very um, helpful to maintain uh, water bird uh, populations. Yeah. So basically, um, by reducing the, the disturbance within those areas, uh, we are uh, assisting uh, these, these uh, populations or these individuals breeding there or, or wintering there in this case. Yes, thanks. Um, I think maybe it's good to continue now with the, the last speaker and then we have, uh, after that, we have time for, for more broader discussions on these topics. <clears throat> so the last speaker of today is uh, Elie Gachet and he will talk about uh, more about specific things related to protected area and how they can help to uh, improve bird adaptation to climate change. Please, Elie. Hey, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. So uh, my name is Eligage. I work at the University of Turku in Finland, and I will talk about um, uh, species adaptation to climate warming and uh, protect, protected area management and targets. But just before, uh, when I refer to species uh, adaptation to climate warming, here I will uh, refer to species distribution change and uh, and, and increasing uh, species persistence or resilience at local scale. Um, so facilitate species adaptation to climate warming is one of the uh, new target of uh, conservation strategies. And this uh, made me focus currently on habitat connectivity, for instance, uh, to connect uh, protected area with the green or blue infrastructures. And that is really, really important for many species uh, like frogs uh, with low dispersal capacities. But for other species with high dispersal capacities, this connectivity is maybe less important. Uh, and in fact, we already, um, we already um, know that uh, for this uh, high mobile species, they still struggle to shift as fast as temperature uh, change. And, uh, and this causes a kind of climatic depth, meaning that the change in the species distribution is not fast enough to cope with the change in temperature. And this has been shown for wintering water bird, for breeding bird or butterfly. So if we want to establish uh, conservation strategies to facilitate species adaptation to climate warming, we cannot only uh, target habitat connectivity. But in fact, we already know that protected areas are helping species to cope with climate warming. Uh, protected areas promote colonization of the species moving their distribution north, um, for instance, bird, but also invertebrate species. And, um, and protected area can also improve the resilience of the bird or the species vulnerable to climate warming. And that, uh, and in fact, this, is, this mechanism can be seen as a micro refugia where the species, uh, even if the temperature are not uh, suitable at macro scale, the species can stay in the protected areas. But um, as you probably think, there are, like the protected area in, uh, in, in Europe, 
uh, are highly diversified. They have many different characteristics. And, um, and one question is to know whether all these natural 2000 protected area are equally facilitating bird adaptation to climate warming. In other words, what are the ingredients helping them to adapt to climate warming? And uh, so we try to answer this question using the water bird data set that uh, Chabols mentioned earlier. So we investigated, uh, we investigated water bird uh, adaptation to climate warming inside uh, 3,000 uh, monitored sites inside natural 2,000 protected areas uh, that has been monitored over 25 years for uh, nearly 100 water bird species during the non-breeding period. And we were mainly interested in, uh, in contrast, contrasting uh, site uh, characteristic, like uh, whether the, the protected area has been designated under the birds or the habitat directive, meaning that water bird can be targeted or not by the protected areas, uh, if the site has a management plan or not, or if the site has been part of a live project uh, or not. So we were really focusing on a site level approach. And it's why we use uh, an index that can reveal this, this pattern of species uh, adaptation to, to climate warming at, at local scale, uh, but also at macroecological scale. And uh, this is the community temperature index, the CTI, which is a community weighted mean index that inform about species turnover depending on their thermal preferences. Uh, and this index has been used since uh, 15 years now for bird, for invertebrate, plant, but also uh, marine animals. And it's quite intuitive and can be um, can inform about uh, community response to, to climate warming uh, at different scale. So how does it work? Um, you, there are, there are basically warm dwelling species, let's say the species, the bird species in Southern Europe and cold dwelling species, the one in the Northern Europe. So if there is a community, uh, an original community composed by uh, cold dwelling species, this community, uh, because of climate warming, might change, uh, the, its, composi its composition might change, evolving colonization and or a Extinction processes, and this can be revealed by the change in this community temperature index and its standard deviation over time. Uh, I will not go into detail for the, the change in, uh, in the index, but what uh, matters is that we can inform whether the uh, response to climate warming is unfavorable or favorable. So first, um, first uh, change in community, first scenario, uh, it involves no colonization and no extinction of uh, the species. And that is, uh, can be seen as unfavorable or inadequate response to climate warming, because we already know that some species are moving their distribution because of climate warming. So we, we, we should see um, a, a colonization by warm dwelling species in these protected areas. Uh, so if we cannot see a colonization, this is unfavorable. And the worst scenario, scenario, in fact, is the second one, uh, where we only see uh, um, uh, the extinction of the most vulnerable species uh, to climate warming. So the species that are uh, the most cold dwelling and uh, get extinct without uh, a replacement by a warm dwelling species. This is unfavorable and bad. Um, then the two other scenarios can be seen as favorable because they involve colonization of the warm dwelling species, meaning that they, they can host a new species uh, trying to, uh, to, to move their distribution to, to the north. Uh, so one is involving only colonization, meaning that there is an increase in species business uh, over years. Uh, without uh, a decline in the cold dwelling species, meaning that there is also a, a resilience of the species. And the last scenario is uh, involve both colonization and extinction, meaning that there is a kind of turnover of the community um, where, uh, and that can be seen as a kind of perfect uh, distribution change at, at uh, local, but also macroecological scale. And in fact, the best response uh, might be in between these two uh, 
uh, scenarios where we have a lot of colonization and a few extinction, because we already know that not all the species are moving as fast as, as the other. So we use this uh, community uh, temperature index um, to contrast the difference uh, between uh, site characteristics. So here you have a graph with the y axis uh, presenting the CTI trends over the years, and uh, on the x axis is the temperature trends. The temperature trends were, were always significant and positive, obviously, uh, while in fact the, the, the CTI trends, so the community adjustment to climate warming, was not necessarily significant. In gray, the gray dot represents uh, the site where the community adjustment to climate warming was not significant, while uh, for the black dot, the, the community adjustment was significant. And without going too much into detail between the different characteristics, what is important here is to see that all Natura 2000 protected area do not equally facilitate water adaptation to climate warming. This is important and is mostly explained by uh, the bird directive. In fact, the sites that have been designated under the bird directive have always um, um, shown a favorable response to climate warming, while, uh, while when they have not been designated under the, the, the bird directive, then the response can be uh, unfavorable, inadequate. Uh, the second parameter that was very important was the management plan. So having a management plan and in addition, uh, if the site has been designated under the bird directive, uh, shows the best response to uh, climate warming. And this has been translated uh, in an increase in species number, mostly by a colonization of warm dwelling species and very few extinction of, uh, of cold dwelling species. What is interesting here, and uh, it echoes what uh, Louisa said about the, the bird directive, is that this, this conservation um, law has not been established to fight against climate warming, but more to protect habitat uh, uh, or species against habitat degradation, habitat loss, overexploitation, etc. But this directive uh, provides uh, critical uh, help for the species now uh, to, to climate warming, to, to adapt to climate warming. And this is uh, key for, for future and, and uh, indeed for the future uh, uh, 10N, the Trans-European uh, Nature Network that will be built on the Natura 2000 protected uh, network, protected area network. Um, and if we uh, quickly address the challenges of this, uh, this 10N, first, um, we need to um, uh, emphasize the, the importance of the international cooperation. Species, um, uh, a lot of species will change their distribution, meaning that uh, at a member state uh, level, uh, new member state will uh, have a high responsibility for uh, some species, and some will have less responsibility for some species. We need to know where the species are increasing and where they decrease, and inform in different in different country in different parts of the flyway. Uh, uh, if species increase somewhere, then it's not necessary to to put too much effort too much effort to keep the species uh, at the, the the southern part of its distribution. We need to define dynamic dynamic targets as well. Dynamic in, in space, like uh, designating uh, new protected area where they are missing, but also uh, a dynamic target in, in time uh, to, to anticipate the future change in species distribution. And of course, we need to provide species specific recommendation to site managers to, to inform uh, what, which are the species that might come in their protected area so they can start to monitor it. Um, but also try to facilitate the species colonization with adapted management measure. And when we know that the species is increasing its distribution uh, in the northern part of uh, its range, when we know that the, the range size is not uh, changing and the, the population is not dropping, then in the southern range, maybe we can say that we can let the species uh, decrease. And this is not a, a big issue. But in fact, this, I, or maybe 
uh, maybe peop um, many people in the in the audience know much more about uh, about that than me. But legally, it's very complex to say uh, a member state will be less uh, responsible for uh, for a species for a species in the future. Uh, if the species decrease, this is not bad. That that I think this is a, a kind of legal. Uh, things that might be uh, uh, clarified in the future to allow some flexibility in the uh, uh, species adaptation strategies. Uh, but of course, some species are not able to, to change their distribution. Uh, also, species, some species uh, are, um, have a so low population state or a bad population status that we, we need to increase the resilience at local stage. And for that, we need uh, adapted management measure. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ellie, for bringing us these results. Um, uh, I think we have one, one nice question on the chat for you. Uh, so you started off by saying that turnover of the community community is is favorable but but why is this really is it really favorable because you know it's about extinction also and we will lose species due to extinction making the biodiversity crisis bigger so what's your what are your thoughts on this so first this is um uh, it, it's a big question at local scale local scale because um one might think that uh, if there is a decrease in a species that have been targeted since decades for, for conservation effort, and this is, if the species decrease, this is bad. And in fact, if the species, if the climate is not suitable anymore uh, in, in 20 uh, or, or 40 years, then trying to keep the species here can uh, be more harmful uh, for the species actually, because the climatic depth is just increase, increase, increase. So in some cases, if the species moves their distribution, uh, that, this can be a good option. But obviously, that cannot work for every, every species, like species in the mountain or uh, in, in northern Europe. They, are, they have nowhere, nowhere else to go. So we need to find a way to increase their resilience at local scale. scale. Thank you. Um, um, so we pay a lot of money for this live project. Uh, they were not not really doing so many good things in your result. Do you do you want to say something more about that, or how are you yeah, feeling? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a this is a big question, and currently we are working on uh, on that issue, trying to 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 evaluate, in fact, what kind of uh, uh, conservation needs, what kind of management can improve uh, species response to climate warming, and uh, about this slide. So the result was uh, that the the community turnover, so the community response to climate warming was uh, in inadequate, insufficient. And in fact, this uh, can have many, we, we have different um, hypotheses about that. It can be just because this, uh, this site um, where a life funding has been, uh, 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 where a life project has been done, um, are the most threatened, like they, they still struggle with conservation issue. So, uh, the, the, the what about community or their, their habitat are not good enough to uh, cope with climate warming. Another thing might be that um, the life project might be grant to uh, target a specific species, maybe mammals, maybe uh, habitat, uh, which is not uh, very relevant for, for water birds. And then the benefit of this life project do not uh, uh, go to uh, the, the water birds. Yes, very true. Um, I, I think we, we have now heard five excellent talks. Um, and I suggest we take a very few minutes break, let's say three, four minute break. And then we start uh, with the panel discussion with the speakers of today, the five speakers. And it will be possible to, to ask questions from the public then as well. Uh, and maybe we get more uh, more in depth into some of the issues that have already come up. So I, let's 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 take a short break, a leg stretcher, and and uh, and then we continue with the panel discussion in in three minutes. So thank you.
Okay, good. So welcome back, everybody. We have a uh, about forty-five minutes for uh, for the discussion uh, amongst the speakers, and also with uh, giving opportunity for the audience to ask questions. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand, which you can do by selecting raise hand in the bottom part of the panel of your of this uh, webinar, and in that case. Um, I or some other person can allow you to talk for a while, but otherwise you won't be able to, to open your microphone. So let's see how that goes. You can also ask questions via the chat. Um, and while you're thinking of questions, maybe I can start off with a, with a sort of really open one to break the ice. So we've heard a lot of talks about changes in the, in the water bird distribution and also from, from Louisa, sort of more the legislative perspective. So what are the sort of implications of these findings if we think about Natura 2000? Is anybody willing to take the word on that? Key messages. Well, I may try to start with this. And uh, actually it was, it has been very interesting to listen to the, all these presentations. Uh, uh, I think they, well, my take is that they confirm uh, that the protected areas uh, targets of the biodiversity strategy and the Natura 2000 network actually is, is delivering and it's uh, very relevant for uh, adapting to climate change. So I, I've, uh, I've uh, taken uh, a good note of the fact that uh, the areas, especially those that uh, uh, have a management plan, which I, I take as uh, a proxy for those that are managed uh, on the ground, they deliver uh, effectively for uh, on facilitating the distribution changes of the species. And this confirms, in fact, that uh, to deliver uh, the objectives of the strategy and of our nature legislation, we need uh, uh, more of these sites. So these is the protected areas are an effective tool to, to actually, uh, well, stop the decline, recover the species, maintain the species where, where they do well. So this is really uh, encouraging, I would say, uh, because it confirms the validity of the targets and the actions that we have put in place. Thank you. Thank you. Is there some other panelists who would like to comment? Sabos, I think you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I think that is encouraging that uh, the protected areas uh, deliver. I think what is a little bit concerning is that this protected area network is, how can I say it? It's rather old um, in, in terms of when um, these sites have been identified. And uh, Diego's presentation illustrated quite well that, um, yeah, basically the, the species populations are kind of dispersing uh, into new areas. And yeah, it shows that the important bird areas which have not been designated are becoming important. What is concerning in that, that respect is that even the important bird areas inventory, the last one happened about 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. And I was part of it, so I know it very well. Uh, so we are dealing with the dynamic system in a little bit static way. I think that is uh, a bit concerning. Um, and I think that's, what I would like to throw into the discussion, how can we make these protected area network a little bit more dynamic? May I take the challenge and try yes. to respond? Well, my my take is that uh, this is actually not a static, uh, a static tool in the sense that the management of the site can be adapted to the changes and should be actually adapted to the changes to respond and to facilitate, as uh, I've uh, learned today, the, the, the changes. So to facilitate the distribution changes. So it, it is dynamic in the sense of it can be managed dynamically and it should be managed dynamically to adapt and to, uh, yes, to adapt to the changes in, in uh, external conditions. Uh, in terms of uh, the selection of the sites, well, we know uh, 18% is now, 18% uh, of EU land is now uh, designated uh, as Natura 2000 sites and uh, 
our estimation is that approximately 26, if I remember correctly, percent of the EU land is uh, protected, uh, uh, let's say, uh, at, at, between adding Natura 2000 and nationally protected areas. Um, and we have a target to reach 30%, which means that new areas should be designated. And how to do that? Uh, well, clearly we have to consider this, this, everything that you have explained to us actually. So where the species will move uh, are the priority areas to be designated and protected and managed accordingly. So it is, uh, in a way, if you look at uh, the Natura 2000 network plus the uh, biodiversity targets, uh, this is actually uh, allowing uh, for uh, a response uh, to the to the climate changes uh, uh, changes impact that that uh, that you have explained in terms of the impacts on the species di distribution, and even if we only look at the Natura 2000 network, uh, we know that especially at sea is is not complete. So there, uh, member states will have to in complete their 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 classifications in terms of SPAs and their designations for the sites under the habitats directive. And again, how to do that? Well, clearly, we, we cannot do it without considering uh, the, the shift in, in distributions that, that you have uh, presented. So it's not a static. I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at it as a static tool. On the contrary, uh, it allows for, um, for a dynamic management. Uh, and even the selection of the sites is dynamic because it can be completed. And, and you would, uh, and also in response to what Ellie uh, said in the last uh, presentation, yeah, Yes, it can be that some sites lose uh, their, um, their, uh, their suitability for some species uh, because of natural developments like uh, climate change. And in that case, uh, you know, the Court of Justice has already clarified that in those specific cases where the, the species uh, disappears from, for, for, from a site because of natural causes that cannot be um, addressed by the site managers, in that case, the site can be declassified actually, or, or declassified for that species. We already have these clarifications from the Court of Justice. So it's, it's actually dynamic, I, I would claim. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is a good point. So it's dynamic, like at a larger scale, right? At the, but then, then somehow, to me, it seems also it's about how the member states are able to 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 coordinate their efforts, right? Because it, not everybody will be equal in the future, and and so when these, these distributions are changing, um, some of some states will need to do more. Other states, perhaps, a different thing. So how how will what what are the challenges there? You you guys think about, and how how can this be coordinated? And any thoughts? Uh, I, I just want to, to add something to the to the to the last question, but then I, will, I can answer also, also to this question. Um, uh, I think one opportunity also to to increase the, the dynamic uh, target of the, the third directive is to uh, to use uh, the restoration uh, uh, law to to take the opportunity to recreate a wetland for water birds, and that can also uh, be important to um, increase the resilience of some species where the habitat disappear and where we want to, to keep these species in the, in the future. Um, but then, yeah, maybe about the, the responsibility of the, of the state, the member states, um, uh, th this coordination, uh, international coordination is really key, I think. And um, what is also very important is to monitor uh, the species and to, to report the, the species population trend, and we the, the report are already uh, in the article uh, article twelve report of the bird directive. So this can be used. This report uh, published every six years can be used to track the change in responsibility of the different country. Then I don't know what what can what should be done to 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 force this country to act uh, uh, in favor of uh, of uh, this or those species. But, uh, but I think the, there is an interesting um, data set uh, when we think about climate change adaptation in this Article 12 uh, Bird Directive report. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to take also now an opportunity to remind the public that it's possible, should be possible to ask questions. If you raise your hand, you should be able to get a, an opportunity to talk. But if you are shy, you can also add questions uh, in the chat still. Um, we talked a lot about the uh, research findings. Um, uh, how were, how do you think about further research? How, how, what, what needs to be done or what is essential? I think Louisa touched upon some of these things and, and I, I know many of you also have probably opinions on this. So if we especially think about um, climate change adaptation measures, well, what, what are the sort of key themes in the research, the key needs that, that, that are there? Some issues came up like better data, but maybe some other things as well. Yeah, if I would like to add here for this point, especially from a modeling point of view, is uh, species adaptability. So we need to, to study with the species adaptability and how these species might adapt to the global change. Based on the study we have done, uh, some species showed opposite effects. So this, I would say, this also related to their uh, special trait or uh, ecological elasticity, which allowed them to be more resilient to the, the climate change. So they might uh, find a new climate, like still suitable for them, although it's an un, uh, analog, uh, uh, it's an analog condition. So for the adaptability or ecological elasticity for many species, we need to, to, to study this very well and how to incorporate it in, uh, in the management as well. If I if I may uh, complement uh, to me as I've tried to uh, to present, but the most relevant research to me uh, nowadays is the one that uh, helps or supports right rather site management or even well site management if we talk about protected areas, but also the wider landscape uh, uh, management. So really understanding the research that uh, supports decision making in in terms of. Uh, understanding what will be the ecological requirements of the species in, in, uh, in the face of climate change and how to manage our land and our sea, by the way, uh, in, in face of, of those, uh, to address those ecological requirements. So really uh, supporting decision-making on, uh, on site management, and and uh, as Shabos rightly uh, mentioned uh, uh, in relation to the to the CAP, uh, how to design uh, eco schemes and uh, and agroenvironmental schemes in a way that really the ecological requirements of the species are satisfied in in the in the landscape. Okay. So we have a hand raised from one of the uh, attendees. So I will try to see how it works. So Hans, you can uh, should now be able to ask a question if you unmute yourself. Yes. Do you yes, hear we me? Can, we can hear you. Yes. Hello, my name is Hans Mielsofte. I've been involved with BirdLife Denmark for 70 years or something like that. Uh, oh, 60 years, I should be honest. <laughs> and I work with uh, work with uh, water bird uh, research uh, professionally for 50 years or so. Uh, if I should mention one single factor that could improve conditions for water birds, uh, in the European uh, Union, it should be re better regulation of hunting. We have already done a lot, I admit that, but uh, it is not so much the number of birds that are shot that are the problem, uh, the problems, but the disturbances uh, that hunting causes. And the, the value of these uh, important bird areas for water birds uh, could improve quite a lot if uh, hunting was not taking place in those sites. And up top, on top of the hunting disturbance itself, it causes the birds to be something like 10 times as shy as they would be without hunting, which means that ordinary people's uh, traffic or, or, or movements 
in those areas also causes many more disturbances uh, than it would without this uh, hunting-induced uh, shyness. Uh, but there is one positive uh, element to this, and that is, as we have learned today, uh, the birds move north, and uh, hunting regulation is much better in the north than it is in the south. I don't say that to, to offend anybody, uh, but it's a simple fact. Thank you for the word. Thank you very much. And uh, so hunting, yeah, it's not hasn't been really put forward here. So I don't know, maybe it's interesting to hear some opinions from the panelists on on that role. By the way, Hans, I, I want you to notice that there is in the chat a question to give a reference. So, but you can do that. But maybe some of the panelists have a view on the on the points that Hans brought up. Yeah, maybe uh, I can compliment. Um, I think it's a, it's a very good point um, because uh, actually it, it's it's possible to hunt in protected areas uh, in Europe. So it's not. Uh, Sometimes we, we think that uh, protected area are um, voiding all um, uh, pressure on, on, on water birds, uh, if we talk about that. Uh, but uh, actually, it's not like we, we know that protected areas uh, are not uh, um, untouched and, uh, and they, there are many activity uh, in, in protected areas, including harvesting. Uh, disturbance is a, is a good uh, is a good issue, and uh, it's true that I don't know a lot of uh, um, studies that focus on that, and um, and it's quite hard, in fact, to to address this point because uh, hunting areas are most are sometimes very close to highly protected areas, um, in and so it can benefit like the. Hunting place can also benefit to protect the areas because they can attract some species. Um, but uh, so the, other, the, the one is not clearly independent of the user because uh, um, hunters um, are everywhere in Europe and manage their land, and they are also part of people um, uh, managing ecosystem. So and, and actually uh, also managing uh, wetlands. Uh, um, uh, Economical resources. Uh, so, disturbance is a, is a key parameter and should be better addressed for, for sure in the future. But I, I'm not sure if uh, disturbance is the main parameter acting on species distribution change or species response to climate uh, to climate warming. Uh, Sabos, you raised your hand. Maybe you want to add something to this. Yes, thank you very much. Actually, uh, yeah, it's good to see you, Hans, first of all. Um, the second is that, yeah, I'm not going to tell you anything new because Danish research is really uh, very good in this respect. And um, what is really um, fascinating how Jasper Madsen demonstrated that uh, designating hunting free zones actually can change the distribution of water bird uh, species and individuals. So uh, hunting free, creation of hunting free zones actually can sustain water bird populations for longer time. Um, for example, in Denmark, instead of going further south. So contrary to Ali, and I, I think that is recognized also in um, yeah, the kind of management guidance is what the commission is issuing that managing hunting is an important part of managing the Natura 2000 and protected areas. Um, and yeah, there are, might be functionally different parts of the area. Uh, but I would like to also bring in another aspect of it, uh, which, which also Louisa mentioned to some extent in her introduction, and that is that because of the changing distribution of water bird populations, um, the hunting bags, what might have been sustainable in the past, might be not sustainable anymore. So under the IEVO goods management platform, we see that there are fewer and fewer gray, uh, gray leg geese uh, reaching Spain, for example. Uh, so if, if Spain sustains and, and France adds to that, um, uh, harvest, then basically the migratory segment of the population might be reduced. 
And um, you can see similar patterns for a lot of other species like Euroasian curlew is not migrating anymore that far south. So managing these populations which are redistributing themselves it has also implications how the harvest is managed. And if we are only looking at harvest management at the world population level, we, are, we might actually make mistakes and contra-selecting uh, those individuals which go further south, which might actually affect the, the adaptability of the, the species in the longer term, as you have seen in Diego's presentation. And this is a, yeah, a long time established fact that there are these big changes in uh, water bird distributions and there are years when they go further south and then there are years when the population is, is staying further north. So we need these different components of the population, even if the changes are not happening at the level of individuals. So I think this is something which probably doesn't get enough attention currently. Um, what is the level of harvest at the southern edge of the, of the range compared to uh, how the population is doing? And, and I think uh, harvest management uh, for a lot of, uh, Annex two species are extrem extremely important because about half of them are declining. So we need to pay more attention to that. If I may complement, yes, we are paying more attention, but it's true that the, the, the implication of, uh, of the changes in distribution is not yet uh, fully addressed. Um, we have also worked on uh, adaptive harvest uh, uh, mechanism for, for the European turtle dove, uh, and we aim at developing uh, uh, in the EU more of this, uh, uh, of this mechanism for declining species that are listed in Annex 2 of the BIRS Directive. So indeed, the uh, idea of adapting uh, the, the timing, uh, but also the hunting bag uh, to what uh, to the population size and trend is uh, clearly uh, there and we need to just find the right tools to implement it in practice and this new dimension of the of uh, you know not only looking at flyer level as uh, Shabol just mentioned but also at local level this is uh, a very important one I understand but how to consider it uh, in the context text of an adaptive harvest mechanism, this is uh, uh, something I, I would like to challenge you on and really uh, provide us with the, with the supporting tool that we need to make these decisions. Um, and in relation to what was mentioned, yes, hunting uh, um, can indeed uh, uh, have an effect. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, uh, in the concerning Natura 2000, we have uh, uh, the, the birds and the habitats directive are, are, are quite clear that uh, a disturbance of, this, of the species population in the sites, in the protected sites, should be avoided uh, if it is uh, uh, significant in relation to the conservation objectives. Uh, therefore, uh, where hunting provides or uh, causes rather uh, significant disturbances, this should not should not happen. So hunting is compatible with the, with the uh, protected areas management uh, as far as it does not cause significant disturbance. So whenever this is the case, uh, it means that uh, uh, hunting uh, should be adapted uh, so that it doesn't cause significant disturbance in uh, to the population of the target species in the sites. Uh, so the, the provision is there and it's again a matter of uh, implementing uh, the requirement and finding really the right tools to, to to, uh, achieve the non-disturbance objective that is set very clearly by the directive. Thank you. Thank you. Diego, you had raised your hand, but I see now you lowered it. Is it so you, you don't want to add anything? Oh yeah, I, I was just one, I just wanted to ask uh, Luisa about the um, sources of information on, on hunting statistics uh, because I understood that not every country requires hunters to report the actual numbers and the statistics so and that makes it diff difficult to kind of assess uh, the real impact in several regions. 
Yes, yes, I can only agree. Uh, I mean, understanding what is the uh, the hunting take is is just the essential, I would say, for understanding what is the impact of hunting on the population and considering the requirements uh, clearly set in the birth directive uh, that hunting should not jeopardize conservation efforts uh, and should allow for achieving a secure status of the species, uh, understanding while collecting data about hunting bags and allowing uh, in that way the assessment of what is the impact of hunting on the species population is, is just a prerequisite for the good implementation of, of the birth directive provision. So yes, for the moment we are uh, gathering uh, this data through the Article 12 report under the birth directive, but indeed uh, many of these data are not complete and, uh, and we are working with the member states and stakeholders to improve the situation, uh, especially obviously for the species that are in decline those listed in Annex 2 that are in decline. Very good. So this was clearly interesting uh, discussion on hunting, but in the chat there is a bit of a, a, another point being raised uh, by several people from among others, Tani Villero and, uh, and Fabien Fernest, which is, deals with a kind of questioning the validity of focusing on the protected areas because it's still a small part of, of what is out there and there's a lot of lot of land and a lot of areas that are also very valuable with biodiversity and maybe other activities even restorations but they are not protected um so what's your thought on that uh, that sort of key thing do we what is the kind of key key messages there you feel of the work that has been discussed today Maybe I would start off because I have mentioned that also, uh, already in my presentation that um, in Europe the breeding species are in according to our result probably more exposed to the impacts of climate change than they are in the non-breeding seasons and uh, most of them in the breeding season are not concentrating on protected areas. So uh, for those species, it is extremely important to address uh, habitat creation, habitat restoration, out, but also outside of the protected areas, and especially outside of the Natura 2000 sites, which might be, you know, they are responding to a kind of higher threshold. So um, yeah, addressing those is very important. And uh, yeah, potential tools could be the eco schemes under the common agriculture policy. But uh, the study, what uh, yeah, sister organizations like BirdLife International and DEB put together, they showed that these new strategic cap strategic plans did not really do as much uh, for the eco schemes as it was expected, and especially not addressing. Um, yeah, the, the kind of preparedness for climate change adaptation. Um, the other opportunity, as, as also Luisa mentioned, I think it's the, the new upcoming uh, nature restoration uh, law and the national nature restoration uh, targets. But we have some concerns that, yeah, the limitations on funding and the fact that most of the funding is already allocated in most of the member states. Uh, under you know the CAP and under uh, other mechanism will will how can I say it restrict uh, the ambitions of the member states that's that's our fear as NGOs so we are hoping that some mechanism will be found to address these um, and and I also would like to bring back here a point that. Um, uh, most of the dispersed, so the, okay, I would put it di differently. A large proportion of the dispersed species and the larger proportion of the dispersed species than the, the colonial breeding species is actually declining. So the declining species would require, uh, well, the dispersed species would require measures on a larger scale outside of protected areas, but at the same time, they are also declining. And we know from um, 
yeah, all of the thinking about climate change that you need to boost the population to be able to uh, colonize new areas. If you have a declining population, then you have very bad chances to generate colonizers. So I think we are in a kind of double trouble uh, situation here, because on one hand, um, these dispersed species are doing bad, and on the other hand, the policy tools are not effectively uh, deployed, at least not in this programming period, I would argue. So we might have the legislation, we might have the, the good will, but an awful lot depends on how the member states are implementing the legislation at the national level. Yes, can I agree or rather say I cannot agree more <laughs> with what uh, Shabul just said. Uh, indeed, I mean, as I, as I said, the tools are there. Uh, the directive, the birth directive, in spite of being very old, uh, one of the oldest one, actually, it's, uh, it allows for adapting uh, to the situations that we are living now. So to deal with, the, to cope with, the, with climate change, but a lot depends on the choices made it by, by member states. And uh, what I also wanted to, to say, I, have, I haven't uh, talked too much about the new restoration law because it's not yet there, it's not yet adopted by the Commission, as you know, it should have been, uh, uh, it was expected to be adopted in March, but then it was postponed. Uh, so that's why I, I, I'm not talking too much about it, uh, but uh, uh, the adoption should be very close now. And uh, um, it, it, it will really uh, provide, I think, further tools uh, as compared to what the nature legislation is already doing right now to support uh, this, these needs that you are all highlighting. So to restore the wetlands and to uh, indeed provide for uh, new planning tools uh, through the restoration plans that the member states will have to prepare uh, to, to really uh, upscale the restoration that is uh, currently ongoing in some parts of Europe, but really upscale to a level that would secure the populations, including of those declining, uh, declining species uh, in, in the EU. So uh, yeah, this will, uh, will come soon. And I hope we will have more opportunities to discuss once, once the, the, the proposal will, will be adopted by the Commission. So there is a question in the chat that is uh, sort of linked a bit to this issue, which, which is asking what are the most effective directives or conventions for potentially creating new protected areas in Europe? Well, I would say the, 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 the strategy, the biodiversity strategy is there huh? and it was, uh, uh, yes, uh, it is a communication from the Commission, but it has been endorsed by, by, the, by the Council, by the Member States. So that already provides, uh, if you want, uh, uh, the framework for the decisions on enlarging protected areas in the EU. So uh, you don't need, I mean, just as a reaction, you wouldn't need uh, uh, a legal basis. Uh, uh, I mean, you have one in Europe, which is the which are the birds and the habitats directive. But even, let's say, uh, going beyond that, uh, the, the the strategy itself provides already the basis and uh, the framework for designated uh, designating uh, new protected areas. And we have put in place uh, a, a mechanism together with member states that are the ones that will have to to, to identify these areas. The the so-called a geographical process uh, whereby the member states will provide uh, uh, their pledges on what areas they will uh, they will designate uh, in their territory and there will be a, a, let's say a discussion and a coordination you all talked about international cooperation that is very much needed to ensure that the areas that are more relevant to protect will be protected. So we will we have put in place this this international cooperation mechanism with the member states and stakeholders will also be part of it to really make sure that uh, the pledges uh, that member states will do uh, are um, 
those that concern the areas that are most relevant uh, for, uh, for protection in the EU. So the, the instrument is there, the context is there, the supporting tools are there already. It's just a matter of uh, really uh, providing science, and this is a task for, for you all, uh, identifying these areas that will have to be protected uh, uh, if we want to reach the objectives, and then obviously the political will to, to take those uh, those actions and really protect the areas that are uh, to be protected to conserve the species. Ali, you want to add to this? Yeah, maybe besides uh, the European legislation, there are of course uh, there is of course the Ramsar Convention to, to, to designate new protected areas and uh, some national. Uh, protection status like national parks or nature reserves that can be used uh, instead or in complement to the to the nature directive um, in in the Europe. And there is obviously national legislation that in all member states provides for the, oh, sorry, uh, Shabol, she wanted to intervene. I, I, I only see now the, the end, but I mean, Just continue. yeah. Yeah, sorry. And the national legislation member states can uh, already designate the areas. And indeed, the 30% the targets uh, under the strategy uh, for biodiversity is, is not only about Natura. Uh, nationally protected sites uh, will uh, be counted if you want towards the target of 20%. So all the legal possibilities out there is just a matter of doing it. Sabos. Uh, the only thing what I wanted to add at this point that this is not going to lead to a, a new mechanism of protection, but at least it uh, leads to a, a systematic review what needs to be protected um, or what are the important sites in the different countries that under the Africa Eurasian Water World Agreement. Um, the range uh, contracting parties and range states are asked to communicate to the Iowa Secretariat uh, the internationally and nationally important sites for the populations uh, listed in Table One of Iowa. So um, the purpose of that exercise is actually to see what is the network of sites uh, which exist for the different populations and uh, have a, a more complete picture than just the critical site network tool, which is based on important bird and biodiversity areas and the IWC data, but obviously because of the limitations of the, uh, these data sets uh, might not cover the nationally important sites, might not cover some of the migration sites. So um, it's really important, I think, that countries are really looking at this inventory and then develop a kind of action plan for themselves, how to protect them. And I've seen in the, in the chat um, a comment from Olivia Crowley from BirdLife International uh, talking about other effectively conserved and managed areas. And that might be actually also a tool. So it's not absolutely necessary that you designate sites as protected areas. For example, in the Netherlands, most of the meadow bird areas are, uh, or the goose areas are not designated as protected areas, but they are uh, kind of managed or try to be managed according to the requirements of the species. And uh, what is important here is to know where these important sites are and what is their functionality in the network and what could be their functionality in the context of adapting these populations to climate change. That's yes, very good. Um, and we have a, maybe a bit, bit of a different take that's also coming up in the, in the chat. There's a question by Sean Kelly, which is trying to kind of, I guess, bridging the gap from the research and the, and the sort of uh, to, to, towards the people that are practitioners or policy makers. So the question here is, have the researchers produced some targeted communications uh, that can be used by practitioners and policy makers to, and highlights what species or ecological groups um, uh, each country might reasonably expect 
as new colonists or emigrants. So what's the feeling about this? Can, 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 can these sort of models and ideas be translated into sort of very concrete kind of things? What do you think about that? Ala. Yeah, I think uh, in uh, biodiversity project, we work to pre prepare like a policy brief so we can uh, send it to the politician and uh, those people uh, work in decision makers so they can based on the uh, result and the recommendation that we have uh, provided them so they can like build a better uh, a vision and better uh, uh, taking better approach for conservation in, in Europe. So on this, we still prepare this, but I think we'll be like in two months it will be available. So it's based on uh, four pro four different pro uh, working package projects. So uh, we combine all of them together. We make a policy brief. So I think, to, yeah, we're in process of this. Thomas. Yes, if I may also add, so I mentioned this, um, in my presentation, this climate resilience flyway network project, one of the output of that was the critical site network tool, uh, which I put the link into the chat box so people can visit it. it yeah, I mean, there are always limitations of the models, uh, but what this um, critical site network tool tries to do is to to show which critical sites are uh, becoming more suitable, less suitable for which species. Um, these critical sites are the ones which based on the bird life and wetlands international data uh, meet the 1% threshold criteria or important for a globally threatened species. So uh, it will not cover all the SPAs and, or all the protected areas, but it, it, it contains some information. And in a context of, of climate change, obviously this could be further improved. Another thing what we developed is a little tool which for each of these sites takes out um, for each of the species at those sites, the different model parameters and say that this site is becoming less suitable because of the increase in temperature or because of the increasing or decreasing precipitation. So um, on the arrival, we are in the process of producing a, um, a complementary guidance to the climate change adaptation um, guidance is what uh, the agreement has produced in the past. And this is a complementary because it doesn't affect the principles. It's more kind of focused on practitioners' requirements and how to use the critical site network tool uh, for getting this kind of information out. But I'm, I'm sure that we could produce even more refined information based on the International Water World Census data, based on the Atlas data, um, and um, other data sources which could be used in that kind of site management context. And that would be quite interesting to, to discuss further how it could be done. Yeah, I could actually also here perhaps invite um, maybe from the people listening that are more like practitioners or, or even site managers, uh, some suggestions perhaps that you feel would be kind of issues that could be addressed by the scientific community that or or, or what kind of co level of of suggestions you would like to hear about um diego maybe you had some uh, some other things too you had so just to, a yeah. little bit a little bit uh, related to the to the previous question is that we produced also a policy brief uh, linked to the climate change impact on, on the Baltic Sea region, together with the Lee and others, where, where we assess the impact of climate change on different primary uh, and secondary parameters that are biotic and abiotic um, aspects of, of or in the Baltic Sea, yeah. Yeah, this is a, 
or what you so th this is really about the the ELCOM. So it's the Baltic. Uh, I don't remember all the, the acronym, but uh, it's a, it's a, um, international agreement uh, about conservation of the Baltic. Um, but I think to answer this question. There are many, many papers um, uh, investigating species distribution change with uh, range extinction, uh, range uh, contraction. And I mean, the, I think there are, so the data or the results are here and model can always be improved, but um, the research do not necessarily address um, uh, uh, practical um, conservation uh, uh, thing. Like um, they cannot be used directly uh, in a policy, and and that need to be translated and, and to be linked. Uh, research need to be linked to policy, and that is uh, is hard to do. But I I wonder maybe uh, it's a question for you, uh, Lisa. Um, I think the GRC and uh, the recent uh, Knowledge Center for Biodiversity is working on this uh, uh, this facet, uh, trying to uh, do research for policy. Uh, makers or with policy makers and are they already uh, thinking about working on this climate adaptation issue? I mean surely they are yes uh, but I agree with with what you said that uh, the the if you want the most difficult challenge is is for is is to make uh, the connection, and as I as I said during my presentation at the at the end, uh, we do need research that supports decision making and evidence based uh, policy making and implementation. So we do need. I think it's critical to create these links, and to make uh, uh, let's say the research uh, the results of your research very relevant and expressed in a language that can be understood. I mean, sometimes communication is the critical factor uh, that it, it is not evident uh, to understand, let's say, the results uh, of, of your research and, and to, uh, for you to put it in terms that can be captured and taken up by, by policy making. So indeed, there is a need for uh, better communication on that and exchanges, uh, maybe more exchanges uh, uh, on uh, among this, um, the, the policy makers and the site managers and the researchers, uh, more opportunities. And by the way, I think I can invite you all to, you know, I mentioned that there is this uh, biodiversity, uh, biogeographical seminars that we will organize uh, very soon in the context of the implementation of the biodiversity strategy for the protected areas target. And I think it would be very useful for, for the member states authorities and, and the stakeholders that will take part to, to listen to the results of your research and in, in terms and, and in that context, if you could really, uh, let's say, outline key messages in terms of what are the sites that will become relevant for what species uh, uh, so that, you know, your research can really steer the implement the identification of protected areas. It would be really useful, I think, for, to have your uh, work uh, uh, supporting this uh, this process. So I will uh, contact you again uh, for that. Okay, I I also somehow feel that this is a very uh, fitting note to end the discussion and to end this webinar. Um, I would like to thank uh, the five speakers for excellent presentation into this fascinating topic and likely really important issues for the future. Um, and I would like to thank all the, those who have attended this webinar. And thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.